Uh, okay, here we go. Hey, and welcome to another talk about behaviorism and meaning. Today I'm talking about Jordan B. Peterson. He probably needs no introduction since he's one of the most famous living, uh, living intellectuals. Um, I'll tell you just a little bit about him because you probably know generally who he is, but uh, influenced a lot by Carl Jung, and but also has a strong background in American and European uh, psychology and philosophy. Did his graduate work at McGill University in uh, Canada. Uh, McGill is always associated for me with Donald Hebb, another very famous uh, psychologist. Oh, Hebb was retired by the time Peterson started there. Um, yeah, I would classify Peterson as a third wave behaviorist. He's not would not classify himself as a behaviorist probably, although he but he has been very influenced by behavioral science. Um, but again, I use behaviorism as just a practical, pragmatic category. It's not anything fixed. Um, but I sometimes talk about first, second, and third wave behaviorist. We've uh, behaviorists. We've talked uh, before about first and second wave behaviorists. First wave would be uh, people perhaps like the early pragmatists, of course Watson. Um, second wave. I don't know where Skinner is a little bit weird, but uh, second wave behaviorists would be people like Charles Morris and uh, Charles Osgood and uh, Peckham. And third wave, say people like Peterson. And there's uh, not a lot of maybe notable third wave behaviorists, but I think it's still, it's current. So it's hard to say what's gonna be important in the future, but I think Peterson will be remembered. Um, anyway, the goal, of the, uh, the goal of Peterson's theoretical work is to understand human behavior. His book, Maps of Meaning, uh, is a theory of action. I think that's the basic thing it is, is a theory of action, also a theory of meaning in terms of a theory of action. And so he tends to define meaning as implication for behavior. And you'll see that again uh, as I try to flesh out some of his ideas today or summarize some of his ideas today, rather. Um, I've also argued that to understand beha uh, individual behavior, you need to look at the levels above and below the individual. You need to look to social organization and to physiological organization. And this is exactly what Peterson does in his major theoretical works. So I think he's very useful for that. This is not something that uh, all the behaviorists have done equally well. So there's usually... Uh, people usually ignore one part of that. There are three parts. There's the individual individual experience. There's the phys physiological basis of individual experience. And then there are social determinants of experience. And a lot of people will look at two of those things. Um, most people don't look at three, but Peterson does look at three. It's hard to look at all three because it requires knowledge in a lot of different areas. And that's part of what's impressive about um, Peterson. Uh, the text that we're looking at today, kind of these post maps of meaning essays, um, have a lot of influence from James J. Gibson. There's another interesting behaviorist connection. So uh, Peterson was influenced also a lot by uh, James J. Gibson. He's a famous psychologist. Um, Gibson was a student of behaviorists Herbert Langfeld and Edwin Holt. And interestingly, Holt was a student of William James and Josiah Royce. And I've talked about, um, well, I've talked about James and Royce. I'd like to do a video about, uh, I, I would like to do a video about Holt, at least in my Behaviorism and Mind series. Uh, but I have not done it yet. So meaning, of course, is a major theme for Peterson. So, of course, Maps of Meaning gives you some hint of that. And it's something he's continued to address in his subsequent essays and articles. This is where we are in our chronology. So this is probably going to be the last video on this topic I do for a while. 
Um, I would like to add some more later, but I've covered all the main people I wanted to cover. So, yes, Peterson is the most uh, recent, the most current, the most up-to-date. Uh, so what to read? I would recommend either any of these three essays, The Pragmatics of Meaning, The Meaning of Meaning, or Three Forms of Meaning. Um, they can all be found online. The last one uh, is not kind of a separate article. It's found in a an edited collection, which I have the title of there. So they're all fairly similar. Um, yeah, so Peterson's work on meaning is very rich and complex and cannot be very easily summarized, but I'll try to at least give a thumbnail sketch of how he approaches meaning, his basic concepts. So I mentioned uh, his basic definition of meaning before. So meaning, this is uh, from the 2000 essay, The Pragmatics of Meaning. So meaning, he says, in its most basic guises, means implication for behavior, or at a higher level of abstraction, implication for the conceptual schemes that currently govern behavior. Okay, so we'll get into how that works. Um, but I need to point out that Peterson's theory is at a more, or it's at a different level than most of the other theories I've talked about. So we've talked a lot about, in my other videos on this topic, I've talked a lot about words and signs and objects and percepts and stuff like that, and how those are meaningful to us. Um, Peterson's work is at a different level. I don't know if it's a more, maybe a more general level, but he's talking about three behavioral paradigms. At least that's the, the word I would use. I don't know if he would call them that. But the way I think about what we're going to talk about is three behavioral paradigms in which meaning emerges or arises. So he, Peterson, is going to tell us about the known world, the unknown world, and the world in transition between the uh, known and unknown, or in conjunction between the known and the unknown. And there's other words that he uses to talk about this. So determinant or indeterminant um, for known and unknown. I think for me, the most useful words are the last ones. So explored, the explored world, the unexplored world, and then the exploratory world or the world being explored, right? The world as being explored. I think these are the most useful just for understanding the behavior involved. Known, right, has a lot, of, it's a very general abstract word, but if you understand it as what's already been explored, it's a little more concrete, makes things a little more concrete. So meaning works somewhat differently in each of these three paradigms. We have different biological and cult cultural resources for navigating meaning, behavioral implication in each of these paradigms. Um, and I would say this differenti differentiation of the world of experience into these three uh, somewhat different realms is Peterson's major contribution to the theory of meaning. I think it's a really useful thing to think about that you don't really find in other semiotic theories. So let's see. Uh, first, I want to say about what we mean by world or reality in the context of Peterson's theory. Peterson takes a basically pragmatist view of reality, so should be familiar from other um, philosophers that I've talked about. Reality, Peterson says, is a sea of complexity, an array of innumerable relations, which are evolutionary, evolutionarily derived motivations carve up into objects and events. This is very Persian and Jamesian, so Charles Peirce, William James, it's very much very pragmatist, which is not surprising since it comes out of, uh, partly out of uh, J.J. Gibson, who himself came out of behaviorism and pragmatism. Um, so objects, Peterson argues, are functional simplifications, the objects we see 
the objects we perceive are functional simplifications. They're simplifications of reality that we can manage, we can make sense of, we can find usable. Um, but we know that reality is more complex actually than these functional simplifications because we sometimes have new experiences that shake our, um, our faith in these objects or that show us that we've been overlooking something really important that we never knew was an aspect of the object. Okay, and this is also very much part of the, uh, the post-Darwinian philosophy of the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, Peterson's unique twist here comes, as I said before, with his three forms of meaning, his three behavioral paradigms in which meaning emerges. Um, his argument is that there's special neural and cultural systems for responding to the world under three different conditions. All right. So let's start talking about these three forms of meaning. So Peterson argues that the world becomes meaningful to us in three different senses. So yeah, I've talked about these, but I'll say a little bit more about them here. So first there's meanings of the known or determinate or explored world. The world around us is meaningful in the sense that we already know how to respond to it. We already know how to respond to it. And this comes through our experience, through our cultural inheritance, through our learning. And then second, there are meanings of the unknown or indeterminate or unexplored world. This is about how we respond to novelty or anomaly, to that for which we do not have ready responses. We have not learned how to respond to these yet because we haven't experienced them yet. It's unexplored, unknown. And then third, there are meanings of the conjunction between the, un, uh, between the known and the unknown, between the determinant and indeterminate, or between the explored and unexplored. And this is how we make the anomalous, yeah, anomalous, how, how we make the anomalous manageable, how we understand what we don't yet understand, how we make it meaningful in the first sense, how we turn the unexplored into the explored. And of course, Peterson's mythological formula, uh, formulation of this is a bit more famous. So you've, if you know about anything at all about Peterson, you've probably heard about order and chaos. So this is maps onto, maps onto this distinction, um, this dis distinction between known, unknown, explored, unexplored, maps onto this distinction between order and chaos. Uh, and Peterson's essays, the essays that I mentioned earlier, go through these three kinds of meaning pretty much in this order. And that's what I'm going to do here. So let's first consider, consider meanings of the known or explored world. So meaning in the explored world. The world becomes known to us, so we know what the world is. We know about the world, and the reason we know about the world is through experience, through social socialization, through imitating others, and through playing together, working together with other people. We enter into various groups. We modulate our own behavior in terms of the cooperative, competitive patterns of those groups. And in this way, we build we learn to build, we build up what Peterson calls determinant worlds or micro worlds of experience, determinant micro worlds of experience, or what I'm going to go with today is motivation, action, perception schemas or map schemas, which I like because it's short and it also um, kind of relates back to his first book, Maps of Meaning, which I don't think used this idea of map schemas, but it's coincidentally uh, kind of goes with that. So a map schema, motivation, action, perception schema, is a known world consisting of a perception of an unsatisfactory present and a more desirable future and a path from getting from one to the other. So we're motivated to make our world more satisfactory by getting from here to there. And this kind of controls our perceptions and actions. Um, so there's probably some built-in map schemas, some genetically determined map schemas, but um, generally speaking, they're learned. 
our ways of getting from point A to point B, and we learn the best ways of getting from point A to point B. But there's some things that are really important that we are probably built in. Okay, anyway, um, yeah, in the known world, there's a predictable path, a predictable path from getting from the undesirable present to the desirable future. If you want to be the winner of a race, you need to run faster than everyone else. In an orderly world, the uh, fastest runner wins the race. So you want to get from A, not winning the race, to B, winning the race. This is a kind of a stupid example. But you get from A, uh, A, not being the winner of a race, to the desirable future of being the winner of a race. you got to run fast. That's um, kind of a simple, uh, foolish example of how a map schema works. We'll get into more complicated things later. Um, I do want to mention a little about the neuroscience. I'm not going to yeah, give a lot about this, but I do want to indicate it because, as I said, uh, to understand behavior, I think you need to go a layer under and a layer over. So Peterson goes, uh, does have his um, under layer, his physiological layer of the story. So the neuro, uh, just a bit about the neurology of map schemas. Based on the work of neuroscientists, Peter speculates, speculates that the uh, sur that survival-oriented map schemas are organized in the hypothalamus, is the, a small part of the brain um, near the bottom. Um, that's involved in regulating processes of the autonomic nervous system, so things like breathing and heart rate and so on. Um, processes you don't have much control over. Um, the hypothalamus, or at least some part of the hypothalamus, and I don't, probably don't need to get into all the tiny technical details, but a part of the hypothalamus or, uh, orients the organism toward certain goals, such as organizing hunger, thirst, and uh, so it channels the organism's perceptions to, uh, toward that end, right? So if you're really, 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 really hungry, your perception, your action is going to be oriented towards finding food. And that's a function um, of your hypothalamus, probably. But humans, of course, do not just survive in this very rudimentary way of seeking food and shelter and water and stuff. We also have abstract goals, which are learned and mediated by the cerebral cortex. Especially, Peterson points to the orbitofrontal and dorsolateral prefrontal, prefrontal cortices. Um, for example, you may take up the goal of being successful in your community. Right? Being, be a winner. Be successful. In human societies, there are usually many different way, uh, specific ways of being successful. And you might try out various of these ways until you find one that works. If you're lucky, you'll find one that works. And by taking on the goal of being... Uh, so, but taking on the goal of being successful organizes your perceptions and actions just as more rudimentary motivations do. If you're strongly motivated, you'll be more likely to notice and engage in opportunities that take you closer to your goal of being successful. And when things are going well, so that's a little bit about the about the neurology. So when things are going well, when we are observably turning the unsatisfying present into the satisfying future, we feel good emotions. And there's also a, a physiology of this, which I won't get into much. As long as we're on a path in which move, movement from point A to point B is predictable, our emotions are stable. So as things, as long as we seem to be predictably moving from A to B, our emotions are stable. We are effectively regulated. Positive emotions keep us going on our current path. Or show us anyway that we are on the right path. Uh, but things do not always work smoothly. The desired future may not appear. This could mean that our current actions are wrong, our current perceptions are wrong, or even our current desires are wrong. So we could be wrong in many different ways. And the more ways you are wrong, the um, bigger the problem for you. 
So yeah, so, uh, so just before we go on to the unknown, uh, explored world, the explored world is about stable meanings. We have stabilized, we've stabilized the meanings in the world that is known, that is explored. So we know how to respond to the stuff around us. We become, uh, but we become aware of some problem in getting from point A to point B by the appearance of anomalies. We desire one thing, but we receive another. So that could be an anomaly. You don't get the thing you expect. So you desire to meet the man of your dreams, but you only meet jerks. The problem here could be at one of any number of levels or many different levels, levels and combination. So you may be misperceiving your situation. You think you're ready to meet the man of your dreams, but you're really not. Uh, you may be performing the wrong kind of actions. So going to the wrong kind of venues, acting in ways that attracts the wrong kind of guy, and so on. Or there may be something wrong with your desire itself. So such obstacles in the path from the desirable present, sorry, the undesirable present to the desirable future, dysregulate emotion. So they make our we feel bad emotions. Our emotions swing, are unstable. The typical psychological experience is one of anxiety. And the deeper the problem is, the greater the uh, negative affect, the greater the feeling of anxiety. If the obstacle affects something at only a superficial level of our activity, the meaning of certain objects in our world becomes uncertain. If the objects, uh, if the obstacles affect a very deep level, very deep level of our activity, the meaning of life itself could become uncertain. And now we're confronted with the unknown. Um, so to be a bit more specific about these different levels, so map schemas, as Peterson points out, are organized hierarchically. So map schemas are hierarchical. We have these large scale plans, which are made up of smaller plans and um, or plans at smaller and smaller scales. So large scale plans might be something like becoming a successful musician. Like I said before, meeting and marrying the man of your dreams could be a large scale kind of lifetime goal. <clears throat> right. Um, but these Goals themselves consist of smaller plans, such as uh, becoming a skilled musician in the first case, uh, in the first case, uh, going on auditions, networking with people in the music business. Um, in our other case, it could be things like making yourself attractive to the kind of guy you want to meet, going places where such men can be found, um, etc. See, these are smaller parts of that over arching goal. And then all these plans consist of smaller plans and also ultimately the particular muscle movements that kind of accomplish actual plans and the behavior patterns um, that actually can accomplish these things, these goals that you want to accomplish. So an obstacle at a lower level is not usually a big problem, right? You can find another way to complete a particular action. If you're a musician and you're trying to um, um, you know, practice a particular riff or a particular section of music and you just can't do it in the usual way, in the way that you've been taught or the way that other people do it, you can probably change that. You can try out some different things, figure out something else that works. In some kinds of music, you can maybe change the music a little bit to suit your abilities. Um, so there's things you can do to figure it out. And it's not usually a life-altering kind of event. Um, but anxiety increases as obstacles or anomalies appear at higher and higher levels, right? As you get closer to that um, big goal that you have. Uh, if, you, if you've centered your life around becoming a musician, a real obstacle to that goal is going to generate profound negative affect. Right. You're really going to be, if that goal gets totally destabilized, you're going to be confronted with a much bigger piece of the unknown. And that's going to be 
uh, have profound negative emotional consequences for you, probably, for most people. Uh, and again, there's neural systems in the body involved in comparing uh, plans, so these map schemas, uh, with what actually happens. So it's mediated again by the um, so these plans, the plans themselves are mediated by the hypothalamus and orbitofrontal and dorsolateral prefrontal cortices. Um, and this is compared with data received by the senses about what is actually happening. Uh, and Peter, Peterson usually points to the septal hippocampal comparator system, which was theorized by Jeffrey Gray. So um, that's something you can look up if you're interested in the neuroscience behind this. And look up Jeffrey Gray's idea about the septal hippocampal comparator system. It's kind of interesting, but uh, too, too much for me to go into in much detail here. Uh, so when something anomalous, something not desired, appears, this comparator system inhibits ongoing behavior as well as the brain areas responsible for positive emotion. It also disinhibits areas such as the amygdala, Another part of the brain responsible for negative emotion, anxiety. A special map schema is then implemented. This is sometimes known as the orienting reflex or orienting complex, uh, a concept which comes out of the work of Rus Russian physiologists mainly. Uh, and this, this activation of the orienting reflex results in exploratory behavior. So Peterson uh, writes, um, this is in uh, the last of the essays I, essays I mentioned. Peterson writes, the beginning point of that schema, the schema for exploratory behavior, is the insufficiency of present knowledge. The desired endpoint is classification of the anomalous phenomenon and its reduction to specified meaning. In other words, we try to figure out what the anomaly is According to our existing categories, we try to figure out its meaning, how we should act in light of it, what its implication for our behavior is. And the psycholog so the psychological anxiety we, we feel when confronted with anomaly is adaptive in that sense. It gets us to figure out the anomaly so we can get on with our behavior. Um, yeah, again, if you're interested more in the nuts and bolts, of this, you can check out Peterson's articles or another article he wrote with Jacob Hirsch and Raymond Marr called Psychological Entropy, it was 2012. And of course, uh, the work of Jeffrey Gray or the Russian physiologists like Olga Vinogradova. Um, you'll find more discussion of this kind of thing in uh, neurological terms. But we're going to go on. So just comparing, meaning of explored and unexplored worlds. So the, uh, the known or explored world is meaningful in guiding our ongoing goal-directed behavior. The unknown or unexplored world is meaningful because it is that to which we need to adapt. It's out of the unknown that we create the known, out of chaos that we create order. The organism has systems for dealing with both known and unknown, as I hinted at or kind of sketched out a little bit. Uh, let's see, so mediating between the unknown and the known is this exploratory behavior, which I mentioned at the um, just a little bit earlier. So exploratory, the exploratory world, meaning in the exploratory uh, map schemas are tentative or undecided, at least at the beginning, Right? So we don't know what something means in the unknown world. Our job is to figure it out. Um, and we need to, yeah, so our, our, our emotions are oscillating between fear and hope. So this is, uh, we have these poles of emotion. So we're fearful that this could turn out to be a bad thing. We're hopeful that it could turn out to be a good thing, but we don't know yet. So we have this emotional oscillation. Uh, yeah, we fear that the anomaly will be destructive of some map schema we have, and we hope that it can be reconciled, that it can be supportive of the map schema that we have, but we don't know. 
But during exploration, we generally produce new meanings for the unexplored by breaking apart concepts or patterns of the explored world and reconstructing them in new ways to work better in the face of anomaly. So this process of construction of a map schema, appearance of anomaly, experience of anxiety, exploration and reconstruction of the map schema is so central to human life that it has become embodied in our mythology. Of course, Peterson's very famous for talking about mythology. Um, and these myths serve as guides to behavior, not necessarily at a conscious level, but in the sense that, that uh, but they're more like behavioral models that we imitate. We don't necessarily consciously imitate them, but we learn them and pick them up. They give us resources for responding to our environment. So with more speckum, we talked about the uh, cultural redundancy system and myths or exposure to myth is an element, I would say, of this cultural redundancy system. We see people responding to situations and that serves as a model for, model for us. Uh, the important myth in this context is the hero myth. Peterson describes the hero myth. Um, well, here, I've got the description there. Peterson describes the hero myth, uh, the hero myth as in its essence, the abstracted portrayal of the process of courageous approach to anomaly, investigation of its properties, functional categorization and recategorization as a consequence of that investigation and subsequent communication of such categorization to the social world. It's a long sentence, I know, but yeah, it's, a, it's an abstracted a portrayal of this process, right? Where you're confronting anomaly, you're approaching anomaly, approaching the unknown, you're investigating it, exploring it, trying different ways of categorizing it, uh, figuring out a categorization that works, and then transmitting that to your society. And that's kind of the abstract uh, the abstract sequence of a hero myth. All right, so to summarize what I've talked about, I want to look at some of Pers uh, some of Peterson's, I almost said Purse or something like that, some of Peterson's uh, figures from maps of mean, uh, from his writings. This one's from Maps of Meaning. So this is figure nine from Maps of Meaning just as the uh, regeneration of stability from the domain of chaos. So I get my pointer it might be useful to kind of point out stuff here, although it's actually pretty small on my screen. Um, but this is, this is a depiction of what he, in Maps of Meaning, called uh, revolutionary adaptation, or what happens when a, a map schema, motivation action perce perception schema, is effectively destroyed by an encounter with anomaly. In what he, um, in what he calls normal adaptation, it's got re revolutionary adaptation and normal adaptation. Uh, in normal adaptation, the map schema is preserved because you can choose another option that's already available within that map schema. So you don't need to go outside that map schema. You just stay within your little world, but choose another, take another path within that world. Uh, for example, if the uh, route you normally take to work is closed, you can generally take another route. It doesn't upset your whole world. You just choose a different path. Uh, revolutionary adapt adaptation occurs when some anomaly calls into question the whole idea of going to work. Right? Something happens and you're like, well, should I even, do I even need to work? Do I need a totally different job, a totally different lifestyle? Um, so that'd be more of a revolutionary adaptation. So let's see if we can go through these figures a little bit, because they might look very complicated the first time you see them, if this is your first time seeing them. Uh, so the two large ovals at the top here, these two large ovals, um, represent map schemas. The oval on, well, they all kind of represent map schemas. I'll show you another figure where that becomes more clear. Uh, but the two at the top, at least, represent 
kind of determined map schemas, determinate worlds, settled map schemas. Um, yeah, the oval on the left is where we're starting, where we're starting out over here. And inside the oval is normal, is a representation of normal adaptation. So let's see if I can even read that. Should have brought my book. Uh, it's pretty small on my screen. But anyway, you've got the uh, what is, the realm of what is, the unbearable or unsatisfying present. And on the other end, you've got what should be, the ideal future, the desire, desirable future. And right, you're trying to get from one to the other. So you've got these different, um, yeah, you've got predictable outcome over here, unpredictable outcome. So if you get a predictable outcome, then you just get what you want, right? If you've got an unpredictable outcome, you're going to need to choose a different path. But you stay within, basically stay within that world. And he's got the uh, kind of emotional poles there, good and bad, hope and anxiety. Um, okay, so that's the, uh, the world where you start, the map schema where you start. Yeah, so if the, the option works out, if the alternative option works out there, then your world is saved. You, your map schema is stabilized. Um, but the oval, we've got this oval at the bottom, which says chaos or the unknown. So anomalous information coming in, you know, anomalous information comes in from the unknown. And that would be like when you get some unexpected outcome, there's an anomaly. And if that cannot be resolved if there's no resource in your current map schema to deal with the anomalous information then your map schema might disintegrate right you descend into chaos the meaningful becomes meaningless uh, you descend into chaos um, and a much more difficult exploratory process takes place this process of revolutionary adaptation um, which this can involve carving up chaos into new categories. You need to reconstruct where you are, where you want to go. And this leads us to the oval at the top, which is the reconstructed map schema. So you've got um, maybe a new idea of what the present is, a new understanding of where you are at present, a new goal for the future. And of course, this process can occur, this process of disintegration and reintegration could occur innumerable, innumerable times. It probably occurs, you know, a handful of, um, at least in like a really profound way, it maybe occurs a handful of times for most people. I don't know, it's an interesting question of what, what the average number of times a this cycle could occur is. I don't know, I have no idea really. But, you know, we talk about the midlife crisis and stuff would be an example of that. Um, and then let's look at a, another figure that might give you a little different uh, perspective on it. So this is, again, a, one, a single map schema. This is from his article, The Meaning of Meaning. So it puts it in a little bit of, it's a little bit different. So it, it's sometimes good to uh, try to understand things from slightly different perspectives, but it's also very similar. So we've got our point A and our point B. Um, this is sort of normal adaptation, as he called it in Maps of Meaning. You've got your point A, where you are, point B, where you want to go. Uh, you've got a planned behavior that you are, are a thing you're planning to do to get from point A to point B, but there's anomaly and anomaly um, you've got these poles of affect, so hope and anxiety, and other kind of good feelings and bad feelings. And yeah, so if it turns out, to, if the anomaly turns out to be irrelevant, you just continue what you were doing. If it was relevant, if the anomaly is a serious one that has relevance for what you're doing, You've got to generate a new sequence of behavior, choose a new path. Um, 
But if you're still able to get to point B, then what you're doing makes sense. You were where you thought you were, and your goal was a goal that made sense. Uh, let's look at the other one, which is, revolu again, revolutionary adaptation. So here, an anomaly. So you've got, oops, you've got the appearance of the anomaly. Um, but this, here you're not able to choose a new path. Right, the appearance of appearance of the anomaly makes the attainment of, or makes your goal unattainable, makes point B unattainable. So you have the descent into chaos. You've got this exploratory world. This was the world of chaos that was in our first the first um, image I showed you. But you've got this process of these two poles: positive, negative, hope, um, anxiety, or hope and fear. Um, and a reconstruction or reintegration of your world. And you end up with a reconstructed, if you're successful, and hopefully you will be successful, you end up with a reconstructed map schema or world of experience. So you've got your new point A and new point D. Sorry, you've got a point C, which is your new point A, and a point D, which is your new goal, your new point B. And plan sequence of sequences of behavior for getting to from point C to point D. All right. So yeah, a lot to think about there. Um, it's an, uh, yeah, it does, it does seem complicated the first time you uh, try to work through it, but I think it uh, makes sense and is a fairly elegant way of putting together these three worlds, the three worlds of experience, these determinant worlds or map schemas of known, unknown, exploration, and then reconstruction. All right, so to summarize, uh, Peterson's important contribution, as I mentioned, to the behavioral theory of meaning is to show how the world is meaningful to us in three ways, which are supported by various biological and cultural systems, uh, systems within the brain and by the myths that we, myths that we tell each other over and over again. So we've got the known world, which consists of ways of behaving so as to satisfy our desires given to us by culture and past experience. Um, this is the world as explored, the relatively stable pre-explored world. And then you have the unknown, that to which we do not yet know how to respond in terms of our specific desires. So it is not yet explored, and so its specific meanings are not settled, right? Its meanings are not settled yet. But the unknown is generally meaningful as a sign of the insufficiency of our current map schemas. So when we experience an anomaly, it's meaningful to us as such, um, as a sign that there's something wrong with our map schemas, perhaps something, some insufficiency in our map schemas. So it may not be specifically meaningful to us yet, but it's meaningful as a general sign of problem or insufficiency. And then the world is also meaningful to us as a transition space between unknown and known. It's meaningful as a site of exploratory behavior as determining the meaning of anomalies, the specific meanings of anomalies. Okay, so again, Peterson's theory is at a different level than other theories I've discussed, but I think it's, uh, it complements, it complement those other theories in giving more emphasis to the function or the meaning of the unknown, the anomalous, or the unexplored in human experience. So what it means, its implication for our behavior um, and this is not something I find that has been much discussed, at least not very explicitly, in semiotics or in philosophy of language or other fields where the analysis of meaning is a big part. So I think uh, Peterson, Peterson's theory of meaning does have an important contribution to make to the um, field of meaning. All right, so anyway, that is all for now. Uh, this is probably the last, again, the last 
video on meaning I'll do for a while as I want to start working on some other things. But thank you for watching, and you can always let me know what you think, questions or comments, but have a great day. Bye.